Joel Salatin, farmer, author of multiple books, a lecturer, co-owner of Polyface Farms, and my favorite title that you have, Christian Libertarian Environmentalist Capitalist Lunatic. It is such an honor to welcome you on the show, Joel. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to be with you, Julia. Well, it's a delight to have you, and I'm really excited, especially um, I've visited Polyface over the years. Um, including uh, driving up there yesterday with my mom. I can't wait for you all to um, be up and open uh, for the summer months. I'll certainly come by then. And, you know, um, Joel, I've read your books. I've admired your work over the years. And I would really like to start this conversation. And this is kind of where I usually start with my guests. A lot of my guests, they're usually more like macro folks who talk about the economy. But I think we should definitely talk about food because if we can't feed our families, um, what else really matters? So I was kind of hoping we could start with maybe a bit of your big picture today of our food system. What are the things that you're thinking about the most as it relates to the food system? Well, yeah, uh, certainly the last three years with the uh, with our mul- our multiple black swan events, uh, you know, with COVID and then with the uh, war in Ukraine and and uh, and of course you know the Black Lives Matter movement and all those kinds of things that there have been numerous things that have that have um, uh, touched us you know deeply here in the last couple of years, and so my my big picture view of the food system right now is that the um, the centralized industrial food system has has now been shown to have a a fragile underside. You know, it, it was presented as this this uh, you know whatever enormous uh, strong thing, and um, I mean, you know, who can fight against Tyson? You know, uh, or or Iowa beef packers or Cargill or whatever. And and suddenly with supply chain issues and these. Uh, um, these things and and the and the the lockdowns and the covid uh what happened was that these very large centralized centralized uh, outfits came up pretty fragile the point being that if you're in if you're in uh, disturbed waters if you're navigating uh, a rocky you know rocky shoals you don't want to be in an aircraft carrier you want to be in a speedboat And so what's happened is that the prices, uh, and now we've got avian influenza in the chickens, you know, so the prices of things in the industrial sector have escalated dramatically. I mean, eggs have gone up threefold. uh, And of course, fertilizer has gone up threefold or fourfold, depending on who you read after. Um, and, and, And on our farm, you know, we don't buy fertilizer. We don't buy Ukrainian wheat. We we get our grains from local farmers right here that are genetically modified organism free, GMO free, uh, and and so our supply chain is short. We're working with decentralized, you could even say democratized uh, uh, suppliers that 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 have a short supply chain, and and so we're in a speedboat, and we haven't had to raise prices nearly like you know the the regular industrial sector and so suddenly you know we're we're feeling i can tell you uh, julia we're feeling like um uh, like like cinderella has come out of the ashes you know like, like we're having a cinderella moment where we've been you know marginalized and, and and kind of oh you know you're just a backwater go back in your ashes and suddenly the world is asking us to come to the ball because we have answers and we have resiliency that the big centralized industrial chemically oriented outfits don't have. And that's a very exciting thing. That is exciting. And, and I like that you're talking about Cinderella going on the ball and um, the resiliency. I think that's really important. And the theme of um, there's these centralized industrial um, players, and then you have this decentralized, more democratized model. And the thing that really stood out to me was I looked at the CPI report that came out um, for the month of January and just like the egg prices um, being up 8.5, I think it was 8.5%. I have to go check. And you're saying that you didn't have to raise your prices. Um, I want to hear a bit more as, about as, that. As much, I'm sorry, as much, not, as much. Uh, I mean, your, your inflation, look, costs are, are affecting us as well as anybody else. But, uh, uh, but when Tyson announced that they raised their beef prices 30 per, 32% 
in 12 months. We only had to raise ours 10%, for example. So, you know, that that's a that's a that's a significant difference. That is a huge difference. Um, let me ask you this too, because I every time I go to the grocery store, I actually I've been going to a co-op here um in North Carolina. I recently moved to North Carolina about a month ago. And I've I I noticed the prices when I'm I'm shopping. How how can everyday folks afford food these days or what's out there? I I don't, I don't want to like catastrophize by any means, but I notice like how expensive things are. Um, just from a farmer's perspective, like what do you make of the inflation we've seen, especially in food in this country? Yeah, and I'm I appreciate you're not tacking on um, authentic food uh, because authentic food tends to always carry a higher price tag because. Uh, because it is it is better. It's more valuable. But how do people afford? So I've got numerous uh, uh, ways to uh, to, you know, uh, eat like a king on on peasants prices. And the main thing is to buy to buy volume, to buy bulk uh, and to stay away from processed and convenience foods. Uh, you know, a, um, a a Snickers bar, a Snickers Snickers bar costs more per pound than T-bone steak. And so, um, you know, there's there's no reason for anybody to buy Coca-Cola, Mountain Dew, uh, for that matter, bottled water, uh, get a little filter on your home thing and and, and make your own water. There, when I see what people are coming out in, in their shopping carts out of the grocery store, I, I just cringe uh, because, because if you, if you buy in bulk, if you buy a half a beef uh, instead of, you know, little individual cuts. Uh, if you buy a whole chicken instead of boneless, skinless breast right now, for example, at our farm, and we have, we're arguably, you know, at, 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 at a, we're at an elite level in food quality. All right. I'm just going to, whether you don't believe it, I, I don't care, but I'm going to tell you that we are um, right now. Our, a, a whole chicken from us is cheaper than boneless, skinless breast from Walmart and Costco uh, from from Tyson's and Pilgrim's Pride, so so there are there are multiple multiple ways to um, to buy better with uh, you know with less money buy unprocessed. So get in your kitchen. You know we've we, we've lost our culinary arts. So buy bulk, buy buy raw. But you know uh, don't get processed. Um, so buy bulk and buy raw and then use your kitchen. We've never, Julia, as a culture, we've never had a more um, a techno sophisticated equipped kitchen and spent less time in our kitchens. We, 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 no culture has spent more time remodeling our kitchens, showing them off, but been more ignorant about how to use them. And so domestic culinary arts is, is, is the way to, um, to be able to buy in volume and buy in raw, and then use your culinary domestic culinary arts and your your techno glitzy gadgets to make it go. I mean, you're we're not talking about spending all day in a kitchen here. I mean, goodness, at our house, our favorite our favorite easy meal is you throw a roast in the crock pot, put some tomatoes and onion. I mean, uh, uh, potatoes and carrots and onions in there. 40 watts, 40 watts, it just sits there, and bloop, 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 you know, all day. And you come home. And if you come home at four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, it's always perfect, ready to eat on 40 watts a day. I mean, that is the ultimate, like, you know, 10 minute, you can even put the meat in there frozen. Okay. And, and so, uh, so there are, are cool um, gadgets and techniques to be able to duplicate great grandma's wonderful you know uh, uh kitchen outcomes but without the time you don't have to go to the spring to get water in a wooden bucket you don't have to put wood in the stove to to heat your you know hot water uh you can do time bake you can do crock pots instapots bread makers ice cream makers i mean we got so many gadgets it's on you can make smoothies you got blenders um you know a, a grandma would have given her eye teeth to have the kind of gadgets we have so when I say domestic culinary arts, I'm not talking about spending 10 hours a day in the kitchen uh, like grandma did uh, or great grandma did. I'm, I'm talking about using our technology with uh, on, on on traditional uh, on traditional techniques to um, 
you know, to not have to pay the big food conglomerates to make uh, frozen DiGiorno's pizza, squeezable Velveeta cheese, and uh, hot pockets and uh, and Lunchables. Those those are very very expensive, very expensive. And if you're buying nutrition, then it's even. And if you start putting a nutrition tag on it, for example, our eggs. We had our, had our eggs checked several years ago for nutrient density. The USDA, the regular, you know, the on the on the nutrition label on eggs in the store is like uh, 48 micrograms per egg uh, of folic acid, which is really important for pregnant women. And uh, and our eggs, our eggs measured 1,038 micrograms per egg. So when you start tagging nutrition to the cost to the price, uh, it it also changes the the narrative. Maybe it makes me um think too, like how we've gotten so far away from where our food comes from over, over the years. And um, I guess how food and food production became more centralized. I, I guess like the question too, is how did we kind of get to where we are? <laughs> well, how did we get to where we are? Well, we were promised and uh, what a great, it's a great question. And, and, and it's, I've actually had a bit of a kind of a breakthrough in thought here just lately, kind of trying to connect the dots and here, here's where i think we we were promised for for decades now that that you don't have to participate in food you don't have to know where it comes from you don't know how to ha have, have to know how to cook it you don't have to know how to prepare it you don't have to know how to preserve it um you know you don't need a you don't need a pantry you don't need a larder uh just depend on costco and walmart we'll take care of you and and that'll give you more time to go to football games soccer practice and uh uh, uh movies and netflix and play video games and, and so we were we were promised this kind of uh, if you just let us take care of you, uh, you will be freed up. You don't you don't have to do chores anymore. You don't have to do these these mundane drudgery foundations of life anymore. You go go play, go play. We'll take care of you. Uh, enjoy your freedom. Well, here we are suddenly with empty store shelves, uh, crippled supply chains, uh, nutrient deficiency in foods, health crises, uh, all sorts of issues, and suddenly. Many of us are realizing, you know what? Those of us who continued to participate, who knew how to take a squash and turn it into a casserole from a squash, who 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 who, who continued to do kitchen chores, those of us who have done that and who kept our pantry and our freezer and bought in bulk and canned in the summer, maybe from our own garden or from, from stuff we bought in, you know, bushels of green beans from the farmer's market. You know, they'll give it to you at 20% at, at, at discount by bulk, okay? Um, those of us who have continued to participate in the system, we're the ones that are ultimately enjoying our freedom today because we aren't entangled and dependent on you know, nefarious agendas from, from corporate uh, centralized agriculture and the inherent fragilities that that entails. And so, so uh, the, the, the epiphany is there is no freedom without participation. You can't abdicate, you can't abdicate historical participation in the food system and maintain uh, uh, security and stability in that food system. If you want liberty, stability, security in that system, you got to you got to get down off the bleachers and play the game. What are some like ways that folks can play the game? Like let's say like they they don't own um farmland or whatnot. What are some of the practical ways that people can get involved play the game as you put it? Sure, sure. So um so rather than asking for stuff at the supermarket you know, that, that's the, one of my most common things. How do we get your stuff in the supermarket? My answer is, why go to the supermarket? So I, th I think that's where it starts. It, it starts with, okay, what is a, if we're going to have a parallel universe, if I'm going to build a, a stable, secure food system over here that's not subject to, you know, Putin's invasion of Ukraine to uh, uh, fertilizer prices and things like that, then I'm going to have to opt out I'm going to have to opt out of that of that system, and so um, 
one one of my favorite stories. I'll just tell you. People love stories. I'll tell you a story. I, I was speaking at a at a uh, a food conference up in uh, Ontario at the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario. There was another lady uh, with me there. She was a high powered attorney, lived in Toronto in a fifth story condominium, and she and her husband. Um, well, she did. She had a baby. All right. And and so she looks at this baby. She says, whoa, you know, uh, what are we going to do? I mean, th there's a life entrusted to our care. What are we going to do? And so the first thing they decided to do uh, was breastfeed. I mean, that that's like an ultimate uh, independence thing. Right. I'm not going to depend on 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 uh, on centralized food concoctors and Infamil and Similac. You know, we're going to we're going to breastfeed. So that was that was one way to disentangle from the system and have security. It's always the right temperature, always the right you know, a uh, uh, formula. So, so she just decided to breastfeed. And they said, well, well, what else? What besides breastfeeding? Well, so, so they sat down and they decided that this has been about 20 years ago, um, but I, it's still just the greatest story. So they sat down and they decided, you know what, we're going to take one year, we're going to take all of our recreation and entertainment budget. We're not going to go on the Caribbean cruise. We're not going to go to the theater. We're not going to go to the opera. I mean, yeah, they were in Toronto. I mean, there was plenty of stuff to do. He said, we're going to take all of that time and money budget, and we're going to spend one year finding our food source, our, 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 our integrity food sources. And so they did. So they visited farms. They went to you know local uh, foodie groups. They went to farmer's market and. And so, you know, she, she, so she, she and I were speaking at this, you know, at this thing at University of Guelph and I'm watching her tell the students, here she is, uh, you know, living in Toronto, a fifth floor condominium in the middle of the city. And she said, by the end of one year, one year investment, we had a pantry that had no barcodes. And, and I sat there and I, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to stand up and salute and say, wow, you know, that's pretty cool uh, that, that if somebody like that can in that situation and, and a professional career, you know, professional career family with a little baby, you know, if they can pull that off, um, then what's, what's, what's my excuse? What's my problem? And so, so anyway, I, I just present that story. Uh, to to encourage people to encourage that the, the the biggest lie that anybody hears is well you can have a different outcome but you don't have to make any changes and you know uh, the the Chinese have a proverb that says um, that says if you continue going the way you're going you're going to end up where you're headed and so uh, so if you want a different outcome I mean that's uh, Einstein's definition of insanity right uh, doing the same thing over and over and hoping for a different result. And so uh, if you want a different result, if you want healthier food, if you want cheaper food, if you want to want to live like royalty on peasants costs, then you're going to have to get in the game yourself. And you can't you, you, you can't just expect Costco and Walmart and Kroger to um, what to, to understand your needs. No, they're they're ultimately. Uh, trying to uh, present stuff as cheap as it can be, um, and they don't care about soil erosion. They don't. They don't care. Nobody at Kroger or Walmart asks. Oh, I wonder if this food is building soil or eroding soil. Nobody asks. They, they don't ask. I wonder if this food is actually nutrient dense or nutrient deficient. They don't ask that. It's all about um, homogeneity, non differentiation, and um, and 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 cheap you know and cheap prices and, and convenience so um you gotta you, you gotta uh get off the, the the lunchables and the uh and the hot pockets uh deal and start taking some personal you know some personal participation in the system take some action there i will yeah. um give you a moment because i think we kind of touched on it at the top but I'd love for you to share a bit more about the practices at Polyface, the regenerative farming that you all do. I've been there. Um, I've done the hay wagon ride. I've done the tour. And it was incredible to see like how also happy the animals are and how beautiful the land is, how green the grass is. I want you to kind of share a bit about the practices that you all deploy at Polyface. Sure, sure. So, so the, the, 
the, the basic uh, whatever template that we're using is biomimicry. And so we asked the question, well, uh, how, how does nature work? You know, uh, soil throughout the history uh, of the of the planet, soil did not get built because people were plowing and and using concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, you know, factory houses, and, and dumping a 10, 10, 10 chemical fertilizer and glyphosate on the land. That is not how we got to where we are. So, so when you look at natural systems, uh, there's a couple of things that you see. One is they always have animals. There's no animalless system. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But those animals are moving around. They're not locked up in a building. They're moving around. And so we use very high-tech electric fencing um, and, and uh, uh, you know, shelter-type things. You know, we have Eggmobiles, the Millennium Feather Net, you know, uh, which, is, which is lightweight, lightweight material, nursery shade cloth, which is literally a, you know, a, a spun, a spun uh, uh, synthetic fabric that is basically space age stuff. Uh, again, we're not, we're not no tech, uh, you know, we're not, we're not opposed to tech. Um, what we want is we want tech that allows us to, on a domestic scale, most closely approximate the kind of habitat and life that, that, that tomato, cow, chicken, or whatever would have in nature. And so, uh, so we dare to ask, well, what, it, what does that habitat look like? And so uh, the cows don't get grain. In nature, herbivores don't eat grain. Uh, they, they are basically a, a portable fermentation pruner tank, okay? Uh, and, and so, and, and they don't stay in the same place. So we move them every day to a new spot that allows the grass to grow up tall before the, the before the herbivores come in and prune it. And um, and so you have this this kind of, uh, um, you know, this kind of movement choreography across the pasture. And then we say, well, how does nature sanitize behind herbivores? And if you look at the wildebeest on the Serengeti, you see all these birds following. Look at uh, look at the, uh, the Cape buffalo in Botswana. Um, you know, birds are sitting on the on the rhinos, the egrets on the rhinos' nose, and the birds are they're scattering the dung. And so we follow the cows with an eggmobile, so the chickens can go out and scratch through the 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 dung, eat out the fly larva, spread the dung out on the pasture for fertilization. And um, and enhance the pasture, and then, you know, our broiler chickens. You know, rather than being confined in a in a house, they're in portable shelters out on pasture where they can eat. You know, fresh grass. Uh, there's no smell. There's no flies, uh, and and they they get fresh air, fresh sunshine. I mean, these are things that are deprived from you know 99 percent of the chickens in the in the u.s they don't have fresh air they don't have sunshine they don't have exercise and they certainly don't have green grass and so that's an important thing to remember here as we head into you know high path avian influenza so the whole point is to develop a habitat that allows the chicken to fully express its chickenness the cow its cowness the pig its pigness and 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 happy animals uh, in a habitat that allow that 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 honors and respects their physiological distinctiveness, that kind of habitat increases the immune system, eliminates vet bills, eliminates you know pretty much eliminates disease, and uh, and I would suggest uh, creates a totally different, um, unseen, invisible nutrient and enzyme pathway in us uh if if we if we can if we consistently disrespect and do violence to our food what will it do to us you know i'm a little older than you are and uh when i was you know until i was whatever 40 i'd never heard the phrase food allergy you know if moms wanted to get together and have a birthday party for you know little little uh, sarah who just turned, you know, three years old, they just invited other moms and come have a birthday party. Now, all the moms have to spend three hours on the phone finding out, you know, who's got allergies, what can I serve, what I can't serve, 
you know, and, and so this is this is simply a a result of us doing uh, abusing and doing violence against our food. And when you when you fight nature, nature tends to to fight back. And so things are on pasture. Our fertility is compost, uh, and and um, and everything moves. And it's it's all about trying to mimic the way those kinds of uh, of animals are in nature. And I can also just attest to this. Like you mentioned, it doesn't smell. Facts. It does not smell. Um, I've I've been there twice now, and I've driven by like the in other parts of um, the state where you drive by like the, the factory chicken house, you can just smell it from like your car as you're driving by. And um, yeah, I think, and also you can see the contentment of the animals on, on polyface. It, it's so palpable when you're there. And um, I want to ask you, do you think like your process, can it be done at scale? And the follow on is, what would be some of the bigger unlocks if we could do that at scale? Could we feed the country on this model at scale? Sure. That's that, that is the most common question I get asked uh, around the world is all oh, that sounds warm and fuzzy. And I like your poetry, <laughs> but ultimately can it feed the world? And I will tell you this, not only can it feed the world uh, it's the only system that ultimately can feed the world because it's the only system that actually honors sustainability and regenerate regenerative capacity within the system. I mean, the, 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 the history of civilization is, is uh, riddled with environmental degradation. Uh, basically every desert in the world is man-made and, uh, and so, you know, the collapse of Greece, the collapse of Rome, the collapse of, of you know, the, the, the Chinese dynasty, the collapse of the Mongol dynasty, you know, these all followed uh, uh, soil, you know, soil degradation. The, you know, the mess, the Aztec and the Inca, you know, all that followed, um, followed environmental degradation and, and not keeping things up. So um, can it scale? Uh, yes, it absolutely can scale. So here, here, but here's the difference. Here's the difference. Instead of scaling by centralization, so so in the industry, let, let's just take let's just take chickens. Um, you know, they we got to where we could have a thousand in a house, and then two thousand, and then fifteen thousand, and then twenty thousand, um, and 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 that 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 scale becomes the houses get bigger the centralization becomes bigger so we believe in scale not by centralization but by decentralization so instead of having scale having scale by a a centralized mega facility what we would see in scale is duplicating our farm you know a hundred thousand times and and you get the same production but it's spread out it's decentralized we could even say it's democratized across the landscape i'll ask you this julia let me let me ask you this in 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 the uh, in the spring of 2020 and, and during the the year of 2020 if instead of having 300 5,000 employee mega processing facilities around the country where all the food funnels through these 300 mega processing facilities. If instead of that, we had had 300,000 50 employee community scale processing facilities around the country, would we have had as big a hiccup in the food system as we did? And I would suggest, well, you you can answer if you want. I would say to. I would say I don't I don't think we would. Yeah, yeah. I, intuitively, intuitively, your heart says absolutely. If we had had three hundred thousand scattered all, you know, I'm talking about uh, abattoirs, um, you know, dairy processors, you know, making yogurt, uh, uh, tomato soup processors. Okay, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, juice juice makers. All right. If if instead of having you know, 300 mega ones of those, we had had 300,000 um, there intuitively, you, you know, that spreading it out and democratizing it creates more, more resilience and more forgiveness from shocks within the system. And so 
So our our product I can tell you this, our production per square foot, per square yard, per acre, whatever, is way above the industry because we stack the same acre that grows uh, grass for the cows, uh, houses the chickens, houses the turkeys, uh, houses the egg mobiles, okay, with the with the laying chickens. And so we're stacking. We're not doing monospeciation. Because of that, we actually get more production per acre. So uh, even the pigs, even the pigs in, in, in the woods, you know, uh, where we where we run the pigs through the woods. Think about the number of the, the number of forests around the country that could benefit from pigs you know we don't have fire here on the east coast we don't have um you know we don't have that tool but we do have pigs and electric fence and our forests are are struggling uh due to a lack of exercise we need ecological exercise just like we need physical exercise and so here we are um stagnating our 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 ecology uh you know in our in our state forests, our uh, national forests, things like that, they desperately need, um, uh, you know, some disturbance. I mean, Virginia Tech Forestry Department will tell you that, you know, we're losing our oak trees because there's no disturbance anymore. Well, but instead of fire, let's run pigs through and let the pigs eat the acorns that are, we're just wasting and, and have some disturbance. We'll save our oak trees and we can grow the pigs and you don't have to have a Smithfield confinement house at all. There is not one single reason for a single confinement house in the world. And if anybody thinks that we need chemical fertilizers to maintain fertility, I want you to think about this right now. The biological approach is spinning circles. It's spinning circles around what the uh, what the chemical approach can do the truth is and i i can go into the history of it but but i know you want to move on oh no this uh, is great honestly joel this is fantastic you can keep going okay all right here here's a little a little 1 minute history lesson so in 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 the early 1900s the world thought we were going to starve remember malthus you know malthus came out with this thing that we were all going to starve and and so um and so there were two schools of thought. One was that food is fundamentally um, biological. Life is fundamentally biological. And the other is that life is fundamentally mechanical. And of course, that came from Justice von Liebig, who in 1837 in Austria with his vacuum tubes showed the world that everything that's living is either is it just a reconfiguration of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. So that started us down this mechanical, this non-biological path in soils, in food production, all this, the chemical fertilizer approach. And his intents were, were good. He wanted to save the world from starvation. And so, so here we go up into the early 1900s. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, no, there's no more new worlds to conquer. And uh, the U.S. is now, you know, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder and the, you know, the, the, the Oregon Trail is done. The, the U.S. Is, is, is done. There's no more. There's no more West young man, West young man. And then we have the Dust Bowl. And but we had these two world wars, which required a lot of, uh, of, of ammunition that's made out of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And so the war effort of World War I, World War II, um, um, financed the efficiency of mining, uh, manufacturing, distributing, and branding of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus for, for bombs, for the war effort. Well, after the war, World War II, you know, a farmer sitting here and, and he probably lost a son in the war. He didn't come back to the farm and dad's sitting there. Oh man, you know, what am I going to do? And, uh, and he, he's tired of shoveling, you know, he's shoveled and shoveled and shoveled poop uh, manure all of his life. And he's presented with this little bag of 10, 10, 10 here. You can grow a crop with this little bag of 10, 10, 10, and, or you can continue to shovel. You can continue to shovel, 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 or you can use this little bag be gentle on old grandpa. Okay. You and I in the same position, we might've taken that bag of 10, 10, 10 as well. But here's what happened in 1943, 1943, in the middle of World War II, Sir Albert Howard released an agricultural testament. He is the father of, of scientific aerobic composting. He brought the formula. It's a five ingredient formula. It's nitrogen, carbon, um, oxygen, water, and microbes in the right ratio to make 
aerobic compost. Aerobic compost was not made in the Western world until until this was done. Go to go to Williamsburg, you won't see it. Jamestown, you won't see it. Go to the American Frontier Culture Museum, you won't see it. Go to the Plymouth Colony, you won't see it. They weren't doing compost at that time. Sir Albert Howard brought that to the world in 1943. The problem was it, 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 it involved the carbon, you know, it, it, it acknowledged that all soil development and fertility comes from decomposing carbon, decomposing vegetable matter, biomass, okay? Sun grows uh, uh, plants, plants you know, decompose or they're digested and you get soil, all right? Uh, uh, but the problem was we didn't have the infrastructure to metabolize that scientific discovery. We needed efficient carbon handling. We needed a chainsaw, a front end loader, a chipper, a, um, a, a, a PTO manure spreader. There were, there were really critical pieces of infrastructure that would get us away, that, that would allow us to do a carbon economy without shoveling, 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 shoveling by hand. And it took 20 years. The chainsaw was not developed until 1957. The, as we know, the modern chainsaw was not finalized until 1957. So it took roughly 20 years for the infrastructure to metabolize a carbon cycle, a true on-farm carbon cycle that mimicked nature's carbon cycle. It, it took 20 years to develop that. Now we have you know, the coolest little, you know, front end loaders and chippers and chainsaws and all sorts of things. And so, you know, we can do the carbon economy very, very cheaply uh, and we can spin circles around the chemical thing. But the problem was in those 20 years, the chemical, the NPK mechanical chemical industry took over the land grant colleges. It took over the, the, the you know, the, the large scale agriculture. It took over the uh, USDA and it took over, you know, the, the entire system to where that became the orthodoxy. Here's the bottom line. The truth is, if we had had a Manhattan project for compost, not only would we have fed the world, we would have done it without three-legged salamanders, infertile frogs, and a dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico. Is it too late to do something like that? or No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, on our farm, so... So you're asking about, you know, uh, so what, what's your deal? So when we came here in 1961, we bought the armpit of the community. Uh, it was the most worn out uh, rock pile gullied uh, place in the area. And, and, um, and we set to work uh, doing this, you know, doing, going to perennials, composting, rotating the, the livestock, stacking different species uh, together in, in complex relationships. And over the years, we've gone from, get this, 1% organic matter to more than 8% organic matter in my lifetime. We've gone from a farm that couldn't feed 10 cows to a farm that could feed 100 cows on the same acreage. I'm not bragging. I'm humbly giving honor to a a design that was that was infinitely made by a, a benevolent creator our responsibility is not to just thumb our nose at it and say okay uh that's cool but we're we're gonna we're gonna go this way um and and disregard it no our mandate is to learn how that works then use our technology today you know our intellect and our and our mechanical ability, you know, opposing thumbs to use our mechanical and intellectual capacity, so that these hands, these hands that have hurt, can begin to heal, and 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 it's the greatest blessing that that soil that the earth um, it is a healable thing. It, it it it's not a machine. This is the difference between mechanics and biology. You know, if, if a wheel bearing goes out in your car, you can uh, and starts going thump thump thump, and you stop. You can go around. You can apologize to it. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't lubricate you. You can, you know, you can say, uh, "Would you like some rest? Let me. Uh, if I rest you a couple hours, then you know, will it be okay? You, you know, it, it won't heal. But living things, 
and I'll I'll might start to cry in a minute, but but this is how this is how profound this this thought is. Living things can heal. The soil is a living thing. You and I are living things. A marriage is a living thing. You can say, you can say, if you've been married a while, there's going to be a time where you have a bad mood day. You say words that you wish I could take back. The beauty of living things, Julia, is that we can that that, that living things can forgive. They can forgive and they can heal. Just like a scab on your arm, you know, you cut yourself, it heals. Mechanical things don't. Mechanical things don't. And and so to treat, to treat this wonderful womb, womb in which we're immersed, to treat it as if it's just a machine. We can rip out DNA. We can put in DNA. We can make a, a salmon that's part broccoli, part salmon, and part pig. And and, and there's no there, there's there's we can manipulate this just like we would car parts. Is an ultimate conquistador mentality brought to a mystical, magical thing. Right now, Julia, there are 7 billion, not million, billion beings in a handful of healthy soil. And right now, we have only named 10% of them. 90% we have not named, and we don't know what they do. That's how amazing this all is. And to, and to stride in there like a bunch of a bunch of swashbuckling pirates as if we own it and we can manipulate it without respecting its historical template, its historical patterns is a, is an incredible uh, monument to the stupidity of man and our own hubris. You know, 50 years ago when farmers like me were taken for free dinners by the, you know, the, uh, the U uh, S the, agriculture experts to teach us a new way to feed cows. We're going to cook, cook dead cows and we're going to feed them back to cows. <laughs> Our farm and others didn't buy into that narrative, but this was the new, this was new science and, and we didn't buy into it. And we were, we were called, you know, barbarians, Luddites, anti-science, uh, you know, all this. We, at the time we didn't know what the consequences would be. But I looked around the world and I said, so where does an herbivore eat carrion? You can't find an herbivore that eats meat. And on, that's why they're an herbivore, right? And so on principle, because we could not find a design template in nature that, 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 al that allowed this to happen. We said, you know what? We're not going to do this. And of course, you know, we were we were marginalized and demonized and everything else. You know, go back to your ashes. Go back to your ashes, Cinderella. And and suddenly we had bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow. And the whole world community said, you know, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to done that, you know. And and uh uh who who was right? We we didn't know that there would be mad cow. All we knew was this is a violation of life principle. That's all we needed to know. And, and that was enough. And it protected us. It protected us from that, uh, from, from mad cow uh, occurring. Yeah, there are a lot of great lessons um, within that answer that you gave. I wanna bring up something from the book, Joel. Um, there are two things. Uh, one was when you wanted to be a farmer, express that you wanna be a farmer, that school guidance counselor tried to talk you out of it. And also in the book, you pointed out, and I didn't know this, um, and maybe I should have known it, that half the signers of the Declaration of Independence were farmers, and it was such a revered profession. I want to hear from you. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm phrasing the question right, but why do you think there was such pushback when you wanted to be a farmer? And do you think that pushback over the years, has it become more exacerbated for young folks who want to go into farming um, would just kind of love to hear your thoughts there. Yes, absolutely. It it is it is significant. In fact, you know, we run a very uh, professional and formal apprentice program here, and we've actually had parents call us. They find out that their child applied for our apprenticeship program, and the parents call us and say, "Look, 
we didn't pay for our kids, you know, math degree from, you know, uh, uh, University of North Carolina uh, just to have them go play in the dirt. And, and so parents are trying to dissuade. So what's happened is that, um, and certainly it happened to me, you know, I was a rising senior in high school, uh, went in for my last, you know, last, you know, curriculum, curriculum, uh, whatever tweak for my senior year and guidance counselor asks, uh, she says, well, what do you really want to do? I said, I'm, I'm, I want to be a farmer. And she about went into apoplectic seizures and what, you know, you're in the national honor society. You're, you know, you're going to whatever, graduate fourth in your class, you're, you know, and, and you're going to waste all those brains. And she just, der- I've never forgotten it. I, I I still have, you know, little emotional scars from that, uh, from that last encounter. And, um, and th- there is a, you know, there is a, um, a, a kind of a general condescension in the, in our society. Now it, it wasn't at the signers of declaration of independence. No, at that time, uh, it was it was the you know uh, farming was a very noble profession uh, and considered as as such. I mean, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson, his vision for America was what he called the intellectual agrarian. You know that 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 was his vision for America. And uh, but over the years, as we've as we've moved um, into uh, an industrial, you know, we had we had the the agrarian economy was where we started. And then we went to the industrial economy. And then we went to the informational economy, you know, once the internet got going and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, f- phones and all that. We, so, so I want you to think we went from agrarian to industrial economy, then to the informational economy. And now forward thinkers are saying we're entering the regeneration economy. We're realizing that we that it's not enough just to be informed we have to we have to be a uh, regenerative in approach um and and so you know that's why we now have you know wellness centers wellness spas we have stem cell research we've got we've got a whole you know uh, world of things uh for re- uh, for regeneration but but this but this stigma this stigma of the hillbilly the redneck hillbilly uh throwback farmer still very very much exists and um and and so i would simply ask uh people that are you know watching this i would simply ask it, when you go if, if you went down to farmers market and your farmer rolled in there with a bmw what would you think you know do do you want your farmer to drive a bmw I don't know. I don't know. Like, I guess I don't care if it, what kind of car they drive, but um... yeah. Well, well, all, 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 I'm, all I'm suggesting is that we have this kind of notion in our culture that farmers are supposed to be, you know, uh, in their place, uh, poorly paid, uh, you know, just kind of the, the 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 periphery, the periphery of of society. Um, let me t- let me say this. Um, I've never I've never seen a group of soccer moms get around there t- talking about their little child prodigies, you know, well, my seven year old plays Beethoven on the piano. And, you know, and one of them says, well, my my Mary, my Mary wants to be a farmer. And all the other soccer moms say, wow, that's cool. I wish my child wanted to be that. You know, we, we don't have this 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 mystique anymore. And and so and part of it is caused by a um, a general uh uh disconnection with a the art of farming what's involved with it how much is involved and the cheap food policy you can't have you can't have a respected farm community and a cheap food policy if you um what what kind of automobiles would we have if we had a cheap automobile policy what kind of fashion industry would we have if we had a cheap clothes designer policy (laughs) Okay, uh, you know that we 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 honor um, you know excellence and pay for excellence in luggage, clothes, you know, uh, all sorts of things, cars, uh, uh, you know, uh, flat screen TVs, but we don't honor we don't honor fair costing in food 
And when you don't honor fair costing in food, you all, then you don't honor fair salary or fair respect of the, you know, of, of the foundations of it, which is, which is ultimately the farmer. And so now, now that being said, I'm going to be very quick to say there are good farmers and bad farmers, and I'm not interested, interested in, in subsidies and all sorts of things to prop up bad farming. Okay. Just so I make that clear, but it's up to the consumer. It's up to the ultimate buyer to determine who the good farmers are, who the bad farmers are, it's the old the old little uh, fable where the the little the little boy goes to visit his grandpa and his grandpa's got two puppies the little boy asks grandpa which puppy is going to thrive and the grandpa says well the puppy that you feed and so i, I would encourage people let, let me give you this little word picture as well imagine you're sitting down to eat you've got your food in front of your plate well <clears throat> squint your eyes, squint your eyes, and imagine looking through the plate, looking through the plate of food. Something on the other side grew it, processed it, brought it, distributed it. What does the other side of that plate look like? When you look through that plate of food, what does the landscape that produced it and packaged it and distributed it and branded it, what does that landscape look like? And if we would start today making uh, doing the 80 20 rule the 80 20 rule okay 80 percent of what i eat i want that landscape to be one that i want that my children will inherit that, 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 that my children will thank me for protecting this landscape for them 80 percent should be that 20 percent can be uh can be junk uh, 20% lets you, you know, enjoy going to your niece's birthday party and filling up on ice cream and chocolate cake. Uh, that's, that's your 20%. Okay. Uh, so, so that you're not a, not a bore at the office party so that you're not just a, you know, a, 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 a complaining, whining, uh, whatever, uh, a food, food prima donna. Okay. Um, but, but, but if 80%, if 80% is intentional and consistent with your value system and your beliefs, 80% is building soil, 80% is respecting animals, 80% is respecting life. If 80% of it is, it would, it would completely and fundamentally rearrange our entire food and farming system. The, the power, the power is in the consumer's hands. It's not in the farmer's hands. Farmers have always produced to the market. The market wants this, the farmers produce that. You want cheap food? Well, we'll we'll do erosion, we'll do dead zones, we'll pollute the ground, we'll make MRSA and C. diff with superbugs, we'll do whatever it takes to put cheap food on your table. Farmers have always produced to the market. And so uh, if, if you don't like what you see, don't blame the farmers. Look in the mirror and say, what am I going to do about this? That's a really important point too, and like recognizing like, the external cost to like, yeah. there might be a reason why something's cheap and you might not be fully aware as to like, what are those inputs and what are the consequences or the impacts because you want something that's cheaper? Yeah. Well, I mean, right now, 50% uh, of all cases of diarrhea in the U S uh, are, are caused by foodborne, you know, bacteria uh, and and so the question is, well, what's a case of diarrhea worth? Who's paying for that? Uh, you know, we we can make a joke about it, but but the same thing is true with superbugs. I mean, MRSA and C diff in the hospital are superbugs that were created by subtherapeutic antibiotic use in factory farming to to be able to, to grow animals faster, faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper. And um, and and when you have those very uh, selfish or short term, I'll just short-term goals you're not you're going to suffer long-term consequences and the beauty of nature is the beauty of life is that it is very forgiving i mean you don't always uh, how many of us know smokers you know that 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 smoke all their life and they get into their 70s and you know they seem to be getting along okay uh we don't know what each of our limitations are we don't know what the tipping points are nature is very very forgiving but eventually, uh, nature will bat last, and there is a balance sheet, a reckoning uh, to come. 
And so we need we need to take the long we need to take the long view. I mean, when when we do things around here, we ask the question, you know, what does this look like in 500 years? We're not even asking five years. What 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 would this look like in 500 years? And you're looking at that long horizon. Yeah, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions. And it, it's been such an honor having you on. And you are so full of wisdom. And, it, and it's just such a delight to talk to you. Um, okay, so one question is, do you think we'll look back at some time and look at like factory farming, feedlots and whatnot? as like a stain on society and think like, wow, what, why did we let that happen? Or why did we do that? Or are you less optimistic that we'll move past that kind of model? Do you think there will be a reckoning of that model? Oh boy. I, I would, I would love to hope so, but what I see is just more cleverness. I mean, now we're, we're, we're now investing millions and millions in M mRNA vaccines. So what happened was the, the consumer pushback for subtherapeutic antibiotic use in livestock uh, made it a little more difficult for farmers to get antibiotics. Now you have to get them through a veterinarian. You used to be able to just go into the farm store and get them off a shelf. And so, and so now the industry uh, is, is, is moving to the, now with COVID, go into the mRNA uh, approach and saying, well, you know, let, let's let's do that. So now there's a, you know, there 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 is a movement um, undercurrent uh, of of certified mRNA free animals. You know, uh, uh, an additional like you know uh, um, a parallel universe uh, being uh, built uh, in the system. Our animals haven't had mRNA vaccines. So uh, and so uh, what I see. And of course, we've got Bill Gates heavily invested in Impossible uh, Burgers and Beyond Beef and lab meat, fake meat. I mean, uh, what I see, it, look, long term, long term, yes, uh, there are there are natural principles that will that will absolutely be uh, whatever uh, verified, affirmed, exonerated. You know, long, long term. But wh where I see us heading right now is uh, is is the same direction we're doing, just trying to be more clever. The thing people have to understand is viruses, pathogens, these these things, they they do everything we do in life in literally sometimes an hour. In other words, they're birthed, they find a mate, they marry, they have kids, they go to kindergarten and they they and and they live and die. In, in an hour and and we are we think we think that we can that we're clever enough to outsmart them faster than they can adapt it doesn't make sense it just doesn't make sense these things do generations do generational adaptation in a day in a day and and i don't care how much invested you are in pharmaceuticals and everything else we are not going to be able to to stay ahead of those so, so what we have to do is build immune systems, build immune systems in our tomatoes, build immune systems in our pigs, our chickens. And so, so you know, ultimately, long range, long, long range, yes, I, I think we will look back because we'll have to. This, this will run its course. This will run its course. Now, how many people will die? How many people will get sick? How many people will have you know, uh, uh, food allergies and things, uh, uh, until then, you know, I have no clue, but I, if you're going to put your faith on a racehorse, if you're going to bet on a racehorse, are you going to bet on the racehorse? That's just won 10 races, or are you going to put your bet on a completely unproven, untried horse that doesn't even look like and run like the one that's run 10 races? I'm going to put mine on the one that's run 10 races. The fact is herbivores have been eating grass. Chickens have been, have been, you know, uh, out in, in, in uh, uh, smaller flocks and, you know, more natural settings. Pigs, pigs have been in the woods and they've been in the soil and they've been doing things. Um, you know, tomatoes have not been fed 10, 10, 10 chemical fertilizers. They've been fed, you know, uh, soil uh, compost, um, uh, decomposing material. Those patterns, that's the racehorse that has stood the test of time. And and it's it's going to ultimately win the race. 
how long it takes humanity to understand that's the horse you want to bet on is anybody's guess. And I have no idea what's going to be between today and that day. And my final question for you, I read um, folks, this ain't normal, a farmer's advice for happier hens, healthier people and a better world. And one of the things I love, and I've seen it on your farm is the chickenness of the chicken, the pigness of the pig. I don't know if you say the cowness of the cow. Um, but my question for you, my final question for you is, what about the humanness of the human? What do you think that means, or what does that look like? Uh, it's a great, it's a great question, and I, I would just, I would start the answer simply by saying that you can't, you can't have the humanness of the human uh, until you start with the pigness of the pig. The, 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 the honoring the pigness of the pig creates an ethical, moral, uh, you know, a, a, a philosophical, a didactic platform, a, a skeleton, if you will, uh, that then that then uh, informs how we view the Tomness of Tom and the Mariness of Mary. If we're going to have a society that undivid that 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 respects the Thomas of Tom, the Mariness of Mary, the Julianess of Julianess, okay, if we're going to have that kind of society, it starts with the least of these. You don't start with the greatest of these. You start with the easiest. You start with the least of these. And so what that means is a society that allows self-expression. It doesn't censor you when you step out of bounds a little bit. It doesn't um, burn your house down when you're when you look different or you speak different or you think differently. Um, in a lot of ways, you know it, it it the humanness of the human is the ultimate freedom. It, it's the expression. it's it's my it's my ability to express my distinctiveness. I mean, we talk about diversity. We talk about distinctives within the plant and animal community and ecology. And and um, and so humanness of, humanness of the human um, is, is, is wound up in that, uh, that distinctive expression of, of, of an individual. And, and it means, it means that we don't demonize a culture because it looks different than us. You know, if we want to take on that, uh, that we respect and honor cultures that, I mean, I've been on places where they don't allow, uh, land ownership, um, there's all sorts of different ways to distribute land. And, you know, I grew up, you know, red-blooded American. I thought, oh, yeah, we got to have property, you know, uh, personal ownership of property. Well, I've been in some cultures now in my life that uh, that have some have some pretty decent um, uh, outcomes where you actually don't own land. And 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 uh, I, we're out of time and I won't go into that. But but all I'm suggesting is to to appreciate cultural diversity personal diversity and, and truly appreciate it. Uh, when Peter Bain wrote uh, wrote the permaculture, the urban permaculture handbook, he had this one profound statement in there that I'll never forget. He said, he said, in times of epochal change, the most important thing to preserve is the ability to think and act differently. Because that's where innovation comes from. That's where creative energy comes from. That's where solutions come from. And we have to respect and honor. I just spent a week in Israel uh, uh, doing workshops with farmers there, and I got a lot of pushback from them. It's it's a very different situation. And 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 I I I one of my preface kind of introductory things to lay context. With, what is your first response when somebody comes with a new idea? Is your first response to say, oh, that guy's a jerk nut, doesn't know anything? Or is your first response, huh, that's interesting. Tell me more. And that tells a lot about our own, our own uh, um, confidence and our own ability to interact with things that, that might be a little different than, than us. I love it. Um, Joel, do you want to let folks know um about like visiting Polyface or anything that you want to share or books they can pick up or where they can sure. learn more before we go? Sure. So we have a website. I don't have a personal website. I'm completely a, you know, Luddite off of social media. I mean, I don't even have a look here. here here's my, here's my phone. You know, it's a, 
It, I love it. <laughs> flip phone, okay? Uh, but everything is through Polyface Farms, P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E. If you if you just Google in P-O-L-Y, it'll probably pop up, Polyface Farms. The website is very comprehensive. You can buy food. We ship, we ship nationwide. If you don't know where to start, start with us until you can find your local farmer. That's fine. We love doing that. And, um, and, and, um, you know, I've, I've written 15 books. Uh, you can, you know, you can get those, uh, you can come to, we do gatherings here at the farm, informational gatherings, wellness gatherings, um, even economic wellness gatherings, all sorts of things. Uh, we're introducing, uh, Jairo Restrapo from Colombia to the U S this summer. He's the, the world's leader in bio first, where in your backyard, you, 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 you get, you go to the woods and get some fungi and you you percolate it in in a in a tea and you make your own uh called biofertilizer uh biofertilizer he's the number one guru in the in the country uh, the world and we're we're introducing him to the US here uh this summer so there's a lot going on here come visit and if you want to you know uh uh, visit with me on one of my, you know, I do a lot of, uh, speaking and presentations around the, around the world actually. And, um, and so, uh, if you want to, if you have friends and you say, Hey, you want to go hear this guy? Um, uh, I'll, I'll see you there around the bend. So it's all on the website, polyfacefarms.com. Uh, spend some time there. There's a lot of information. I love it. Well, Joel Salatin has been an absolute honor and treat having you on the show. I am so grateful for you. And thank you for being so generous with your time and your ideas. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Joel Salatin. Thank you for having me. Hey, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that video. Be sure to hit that like button, the subscribe and that bell so you won't miss any new videos.